Thank you again. Thank you, Fede. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to present my uh, ongoing work. Um, none, none of this is published and it's really a work in progress so far. So, so as Fede was saying, when I was in New York, uh, we, we had the opportunity, we were two labs, the Merad lab and the Randolph lab, and what, what we were doing uh, daily was to purify from organs, uh, from mouse organs, all the dendritic cell and the macrophage subset uh, in each of these organs. And we had the opportunity to work with uh, the Immunological Genome Consortium uh, to uh, do the transcriptome of those uh, highly purified uh, macrophage and dendritic cell subset of, uh, of uh, mice. And uh, so this was a microarray at the time, uh, of, of course, bulk population. And um, something that came out uh, quite, uh, quite surprisingly is that when you put in a, in a PCA analysis all those population macrophages coming from the lung or from uh, the brain or from the peritoneum and dendritic cells coming also from a various uh, location, what you can see is that there is a, a very big heterogeneity uh, at the transcriptomic level. And what is quite um, interesting and striking is that when you look at macrophages, they are very, very, very different uh, between each other. And uh, sometimes uh, they are more different, uh, they, are more, they are closer to a dendritic cell than to a macrophage. So uh, this, this uh, heterogeneity of macrophages was um, has many uh, different uh, explanations, but something that came uh, up in parallel of this uh, transcriptomic study is that, in fact, um, uh, using lineage, uh, genetic lineage tracing of uh, macrophages to understand the origin of these macrophages, what uh, we understood, in fact, is that in organs, in, in non-lymphoid peripheral organs, um, macrophage derived from an embryogenic um, uh, precursor that in fact uh, is, uh, appears during embryo, embryogenesis and seeds every organ during embryogenesis and then stays in the organs, self-maintains through proliferation and give rise to the pool of macrophages in each organ. And so in adult life, in fact, all the macrophages that are in our organs have uh, an embryogenesis genic origin, and in fact the circulating monocytes that uh, are continuously coming from our adult bone marrow really uh, minimally contribute to this pool of peripheral macrophages. Instead, when there is an inflammation and that uh, an infection or, or tumor, of, of course, you have uh, uh, many inflammatory signals that will attract monocytes that will, at this point, differentiate into macrophages. But in the steady state, most of our, of our macrophages in organs, in fact, do not derive from a monocyte. And this is a first layer of uh, heterogeneity, because you see that, in fact, macrophages can, can in fact, in a tissue, upon inflammation, come from resident, uh, tissue resident uh, pool of macrophages versus uh, circulating monocytes. And, uh, and so here uh, is uh, depicted a sort of uh, uh, the, the view, uh, so, so it's a layer of complexity uh, based on the development of cells, where you see here at the level of the macrophages, so either they have an embryonic origin, either they can come from adult bone marrow and be replaced by monocyte-derived cells, but this is only upon uh, inflammation or tissue injury, and this is the first layer of heterogeneity that we can uh, account for. But, of course, uh, something that is also very, very important to keep in mind is that each, uh, each macrophage seeds one organ, and uh, each organ has, has uh, many, many different uh, cues, molecular cues, that influence the identity of macrophages. And uh, this is really, really important in macrophage biology because, in fact, macrophages, what they do, they, of course, are uh, innate immune cells that are there to, 
to uh, phagocyte uh, pathogen, etc. But they are also very important for the homeostasis of the tissue. And in fact, they are in a constant crosstalk between macrophages and, uh, and the tissue. And the tissue give, gives survival signal to the macrophages. And in turn, macrophages also give um, have function to maintain the homeostasis of the tissue. So there is a constant crosstalk, and this crosstalk really shapes the identity and the function of macrophages, and is very, very dependent of the, the, the location uh, of the tissue. Um, for example, this is also highlighted here. You see, for example, lung macrophages, alveolar macrophages, um, so the epithelium, the lung epithelium is uh, able to, uh, to produce GMCSF, which is a growth factor that is very important for the survival of alveolar macrophages. And in turn, uh, alveolar macrophages are here to clear the surfactant, which is essential also for the, the homeostasis of the lung. Uh, and for example, here in the brain, you have also a crosstalk between the neurons that secrete MCSF, another very important growth factor for uh, the macrophages, and the, the microbial cell, the brain macrophages, also uh, secrete some uh, neurotransmitters that allows the, 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 the good uh, functioning of uh, brain cells. So the first, uh, the first message I want to, to give you is that in fact, macrophages are very diverse uh, cell type, and is a very plastic cell type. And there is different layers of heterogeneity that, uh, that are important. The first one is the origin of those macrophages. Are they coming from an embryonic precursor or from a monocytic origin? The imprinting by enviro environmental cues, which is also a very, very strong uh, uh, layer of, uh, of uh, heterogeneity. And, um, and also the fact that, uh, again, macrophages are not just innate cells uh, here to defend the, the, the tissue integrity, but they are also very important in homeostasis, and they have this very uh, strong crosstalk with epitheliums and other uh, stromal cells. So now, the, the question we are, we are interested in, in, uh, in my group and in, uh, in, actually in the, in the unit, in the unit uh, I'm working in, is, um, what is the, how the, the tumor microenvironment uh, shapes the, the immune, uh, cell content, uh, immune cell content of tumors. And uh, in my case, I'm really more focusing on macrophages and dendritic cells, but here I will talk about macrophages. And uh, the, the question I would like to understand is how um, these macrophages uh, impact tumor development and also impact uh, anti-tumor immunity. So some, also what you, what you may know is that depending on the, the cancer type and the tissue involved uh, by, uh, by the tumor, you have a diff diverse um, uh, composition of immune cells in your tumor. So here is a very uh, a nice uh, example where you see all the, the immune cell type that are composing the, the different uh, tumor microenvironment. But something that is also quite uh, evident uh, now and quite well established is that in fact macrophage density is a predictor of, of poor survival. So you have a lot of macrophages here in peak, mostly in, in a lot of tumors, and more you have macrophages, uh, uh, less, uh, less good is your prognosis. Uh, so the sort of the, the paradigm of uh, tumor-associated macrophages is that there are uh, pro-tumoral uh, cells and that they will help in various, various ways to, uh, they will help the tumor cells to grow and to spread and to metastasize. And uh, here are, are the highlighted the different, uh, different mechanisms by which TAMs um, uh, help tumors to develop. And I think it's, from, uh, from, from my perspective, I think it's really um, intriguing to understand how a single cell can exert so many functions. So, Maybe this also calls for uh, uh, 
thinking that maybe th there is not one tumor associated macrophages but various ones. And um, also the other uh, thing I wanted to uh, highlight here is that again, exactly like in homeostasis in tissue in homeostasis, you have a crosstalk between macrophages and tumor cells. In fact, macrophages are uh, so tumor cells sorry, are able also to uh, produce a uh, growth factor that help macrophages to survive inside the tumor. And in turn, macrophages also can uh, produce factors that help, uh, for example, here, the tumor cells to move uh, with uh, this, uh, in the, for example, EGF, EGFR um, axis. Uh, and so there is this continuous crosstalk, and, and really macrophages are sort of uh, a trophic cell type that will help the tumor to grow. Uh, however, it's also known that uh, in certain circumstances, TAMS can uh, be more inflammatory and can uh, also, um, sorry, this is my next slide. So here, again, no, so this is more the pro-inflammatory uh, role of TAMS, so they can also suppress the immune response uh, by various also mechanisms uh, of uh, uh, cytokine secretion like IL-10, TGF-beta, or uh, enzyme here uh, to, uh, to starve T cells, etc. But, so, uh, when you now look into human data, in, into clinical data, what is reported is in some cases, in some types of cancer, macrophages in fact are not so bad for the tumor, are not a bad prognosis. And so here, this is the case, for example, for colorectal cancer, and uh, for lung or bone or prostate, you have conflicting data. And in the red, you can see where uh, macrophages are really a, a bad prognosis. But all those clinical uh, um, data, in fact, have been done with really a restricted set of markers, uh, using really maybe one or two uh, markers to define macrophages in those tumors. So here now, a big challenge with all this uh, new technology of single cell, of uh, multicolor flow cytometry, is to uh, redefine those macrophages to understand better their, their function. Uh, so, so, so my group here uh, today is composed of uh, a postdoc, uh, a bioinformatician, and a PhD student. And uh, the four of us, we are trying to really understand uh, what is the heterogeneity of macrophages in breast cancer. And we are part of a, a bigger team uh, directed by Eliane Piaggio. And uh, it's also a, a transnational immunotherapy team. And we have, the, we have the luck to have access, in fact, to uh, patient samples from the Hôpital Curie. And uh, this is mainly a breast cancer uh, patient. And so what we have done in the first place to try to tackle a bit this, um, this, this uh, complexity of the tumor microenvironment, we have uh, started to ask if... Uh, so we, we had access, in fact, to uh, the tumor, the primary breast tumor, but also to the lymph node draining those tumors. And in fact, we were able to, um, to, to distinguish between lymph nodes that were invaded by the tumor cells, that were metastatic uh, lymph nodes, versus lymph nodes that were non-invaded. And so we had the opportunity to analyze the immune cell content of, of all those tissues, of human tissues, and we, uh, we asked what is the impact of uh, the, the tumor metastasis in the lymph node, for example, on the immune cell content. And here is an example how we, um, how we detect tumor cells in a lymph node. So here you see we stand for EPCAM and for CD45, which stand for all the, the immune hematopoietic derived cells. And here it's a non-invaded <coughs> lymph node, here uh, invaded lymph node, and this is the tumor. And so what you can already see that in the tumor, for example, in this example, you have a really a massive infiltration of immune cells, in fact, that are uh, out-competing tumor cells in this case. And this is a, a lymph node. 
And so we started to uh, phenotype by classical flow cytometry, maybe it was no, no more than 10 parameters. We started to uh, phenotype all the, the phagocytes that were uh, found in those tumor and in those tumor draining lymph nodes uh, using uh, different uh, strategies. And we looked at uh, type 1 dendritic cells, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, type 2 dendritic cells, etc., etc. And what was quite clear was that, in fact, the only uh, cell type that was really increased in, uh, in lymph nodes that were invaded by the tumor were the cells that express CD14. And CD14 is a very well-known marker for monocytes and macrophages in humans. And so what we, uh, we saw is that there was a, a significant increase in this population. And here, if you quantify all this, you see that all the other populations do not really move, but only these uh, monocyte macrophages and maybe inflammatory disease uh, are, uh, are recruited to uh, lymph nodes that are invaded by the tumor. And here, this is how we gate on those cells. So at the time, so it was before we started to do single cell analysis, so we had, in fact, only uh, really two markers, the CD1C to distinguish dendritic cells and CD14 to distinguish uh, macrophages and monocytes inside tumors. And what you see, this is the work of uh, Rodrigo Ramos, what you see is that you see a very, very nice correlation. When you have more, more tumor cells, you have more of those of CD14 cells, and in the tumor you have even more of these cells. When, you, when we had the opportunity to, to get several lymph nodes from the same patient, we also could draw this correlation between the, no, the percentage of EBCAM tumor positive cells and CD14 cells. So this is a, a, a very uh, robust uh, phenotype. And so we, we, uh, we, we wanted to go a bit deeper in the analysis of these uh, macrophages and started to do single cell transcriptomics, single cell RNA seq uh, uh, experiments. And so, what we did, we fax sorted uh, CD11 C positive, uh, class 2 positive cells from uh, invaded lymph node and primary tumor and blood. And we did single cell RNA seq, so every single uh, cell. Uh, as his transcriptome analyzed, and then, uh, then uh, we need, of, of course, bioinformatician to deal with this uh, huge amount of data. And, uh, and so what you can see here is a UMAP, which is a, another a way of representing the antisme. You see the visualization of, uh, so here we pulled uh, cells from metastatic lymph node, tumor, and blood. And so this is all the different clusters that you can find uh, in uh, those organs. And here, if you look at tissue distribution of those, those, those cells, you see that some cells are enriched in lymph nodes, some are enriched in tumors, and some are enriched in, uh, in blood. And so uh, to try to understand what uh, were those populations, we uh, use known marker from the literature, a canonical marker, to try to identify each of these clusters, and so we could identify plasma cytoid disease, type 2 disease, type 1 disease, etc., etc. But when we looked at CD14 cells, this is the big uh, blob in the middle, you can see that we have uh, at least seven uh, subtypes of CD14 cells. So uh, we uh, so here is the CD14 expression. So you see, it's really a, a big, big staining for a big, big population. And so you see also here tissue distribution of those population. You see that a, a really important population of CD14 cells is in fact circulating monocyte because here we we have merged the blood. But other uh, CD14 population are specific to the lymph node and the tumor. And uh, we also applied some uh, other type of signature, blood uh, monocyte, for example, again, I, uh, it's in the blood, and also a new gene signature that are coming from uh, also data, uh, single cell data. And we uh, started to identify tumor-associated macrophages, and you see this nice dichotomy between 
the monocyte and uh, the, macro, the tumor associated macrophages. And uh, like um, uh, we were saying, in fact, we started to analyze better those single cell, single cell genes and try to find uh, genes that were exclusively expressed in one or the other marker. And we found, for example, S108 really is a very specific for blood monocyte while APOE is really highly expressed and not at all in monocyte, but highly expressed in a tumor associated macrophages. And we started, we came back to flow cytometry to test if those um, markers, th those genes that we found in single cell were uh, applicable for flow cytometry. And we found that indeed, for example, in the blood, you see that um, if you get on CD14 cells, they are all CD108 positive. And uh, if you go to the tumor draining lymph node, invaded tumor draining lymph node, or the tumor, you see that you find those monocytes that, are, that have infiltrated, uh, infiltrated the tumor or the lymph node, but you see that they start to express APOE, and, uh, and you have also population of uh, APOE-positive CD14 cells. So you see here appearing a heterogeneity in your CD14 gate. And if you take a healthy tissue uh, near the tumor, you find that in fact you don't have the APOE, uh, po you have much less of the APOE positive cells. So this APOE uh, expression in CD14 cells really sign uh, a tumor associated uh, macrophage. Um, we also confirmed that uh, the APOE expression uh, was co-regulated with some uh, classical uh, macrophage marker like CD64, for example, or C1QA, um, uh, CD204, MSR1. And here we also confirmed that, in fact, monocytes were highly expressed in CCR2. So as you may know, CCR2 is a very important uh, chemokine receptor that uh, uh, allows monocyte to uh, to reach tissue uh, when this tissue is secreting, of course, CCL2, the, the ligand. And uh, it's really uh, an important uh, chemokine receptor to identify monocyte. And we confirm this also in humans. So you see that S108 uh, positive cells are CCR2 high. Uh, then uh, when they upregulate APOE, they start to downregulate CCR2. And at the end, when they are APOE positive and S108 negative, so they were, when they are terminally differentiated, they have uh, <coughs> uh, lost the CCR2 expression. So now uh, we were able to uh, distinguish uh, inside the CD14 positive cell, we were able to distinguish between infiltrating monocytes that were CCR2 high and uh, tumor-associated macrophages. And here, what you see, for example, again, is that APOE is really higher in a metastatic lymph node or in primary tumor and not in juxta tumor, and that you always have this infiltrating monocyte. Then here, uh, what you can also uh, do is to... Uh, um, how do you say that? To, to separate uh, lymph node uh, according to the level of invasion by the tumor. For example, we, we set up a threshold at 2%, so you have lymph nodes that, uh, that are invaded but not a lot, and uh, lymph nodes that are highly invaded. And when you look at the, the number of APOE-positive uh, macrophages uh, in between those two types of lymph nodes, you see really an enrichment in APOE-positive uh, macrophages in tumor-invaded lymph nodes. So we also now are uh, trying to, uh, so, so the idea also of all this is of course to understand the function and one way to understand the function of cells is also to try to understand where these macrophages are located. And so this, these are really preliminary data again, but what we see when we stand for APOE in a tumor draining lymph node, uh, we see that in fact um, APOE macrophages uh, lie near, they are not in the tumor, but they are near the tumor. They are, seem to be attracted by uh, the tumor. And here maybe it's a bit clearer. So uh, here you see the EPCAM staining of an invaded lymph node. Uh, 
uh, which overlay uh, with another uh, marker for tumor cells. So this is really uh, the, the tumor infiltrating, the, the invading the lymph node. And when you look at APOE, you find those APOE cells near uh, the tumor border. Uh, it's um, co-expressed with CD11C, which in human is also a marker for macrophages. And uh, wh what is also interesting, we look at T cells and we see that they are also in contact with T cells. So we, so of course now it's the beginning, but we are trying to explore what are the roles of those macrophages. So the first conclusion um, is uh, that among CD14 positive cells, you at least have three populations, but I will sh show you a bit more population. So you have those infiltrating monocytes that are CCR2 high and S108 high. You have a population that we think are, is a, a monocyte starting to differentiate into macrophage, with, which start to upregulate APOE but keeps some of the, the, the S108 uh, expression. And then you have these uh, APOE-positive macrophages um, that have lost uh, uh, S108 and CCR2. So then, in parallel of all this, we uh, studied a collaboration with Florent Gino in Singapore because he uh, was mastering the site of of myeloid cells in, in human samples, and he, uh, we sent him uh, some uh, tumor-invaded lymph node, and he uh, sent us back those data, that was very nice, uh, where he uh, did, uh, I think, more than 30, uh, I think it was maybe 40, I don't remember exactly how many parameters, or how many uh, uh, markers he looked at, but he, uh, he gave us back those data with a panel of uh, a myeloid marker. And so here we find our CD14 positive cells. Here is highlighted CD1C, those are the dendritic cells. And what uh, we saw again is uh, a quite big heterogeneity inside the CD14 cells. So here we gated in the CD14 positive cells. And what you see again, so you see CCR2, I was just showing you that. But when you look at other markers, CD64, CD68, that are macrophage markers, you see that they don't stain exactly the same population. And um, we started, and so this is a heat map uh, of all those markers, and you see uh, appearing a heterogeneity inside the CD14 positive cell. So we went back to our single cell uh, data. And uh, we started to look at the genes that were defining all those clusters. And we, uh, we defined, uh, we, we identified, sorry, we identified genes that were really specific of one or the other marker. And so this is a list of, of genes that uh, are specific for one uh, APOE positive uh, macrophages. For this double positive APOE S108, there are other markers. You have the monocytes, and you have, in fact, we found that there were two, at least two positive, APOE positive macrophages uh, that were expressing very different uh, gene signature. This was, uh, again, the case in the primary tumor, so we could find both, uh, both macrophages, this one that we later call FOLAR2, and this one. And when we interrogate a public database uh, with those genes that we have defined from our single cell and, and ask whether in breast cancer patients those gene signatures have an impact on the survival of patients, you see that in fact you have very different outcomes. This, TAM, this APOE positive TAM in fact, is, uh, has a bad prognosis. So when you have high, uh, high level of those transcript in breast tumor, you have, uh, you have, uh, you survive less. While you, when you have those transcripts from the other uh, population, you survive better. So here, with just with this uh, quite restricted sets of marker, we we are able to. Uh, to distinguish two populations of macrophages that may have different <coughs> impact on, on the, the tumor development. So 
Of course, we focused on the, the bad ones for the moment, also because I had, I will uh, show you later, they have a, a set of genes that is uh, reminiscent of other type of uh, macrophages in other type of disease. And so we started to look to uh, specific markers uh, that we could uh, use by flow cytometry to be able to look at those cells, just uh, like we were saying before. So here you see they are all CD14. So if you just take CD14, you cannot distinguish those uh, populations. So here you have the APOE macrophages. In the middle, you have this, uh, those monocytes. And here you have this uh, cell that is transitioning. But here we could find also markers that was exclusively expressed in the first macrophage population and in the other population. And so we came up with a new gating strategy to be able to distinguish uh, those macrophages. So gating on uh, CD11, CDR, we exclude. So yeah, I have to tell you that in fact, the problem of this marker is it's also expressed by a type one dendritic cells. We, so we have to exclude those, those cells. Here you see, we use XCR1 and CADM1. So we exclude type one disease, we keep all the rest and then we have here uh, type 2 dendritic cells. You can see here a picture of this. And then we took all the CD14 positive cells. Inside the CD14, we were able again to distinguish CCR2 positive monocytes that are here. And we took what is CCR2 negative. And here we were able with the, our two new markers to distinguish between FOLER2 positive macrophages and CADM1 positive macrophages. And you see here the, the two macrophages. So, so this tells you again that inside this uh, CD14 population, in fact, we were able to, to distinguish at least three populations. And we are also trying to analyze this one, which is more or less abundant depending on the samples. So now what we are doing, because the technique we're using for single cell is uh, quite uh, shallow and doesn't give you a really, uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, gene dropout and uh, it doesn't, it's not very quantitative. So we are resorting all those cells according to our new gating strategy to do uh, RNA-seq bulk and to go uh, much deeper into the sequencing of the cells and then to be able to ask um, uh, to understand more their function and um, to, to look also at known uh, marker like CD163. This one is a really uh, marker that is really uh, highly used in clinical studies to, to look at macrophages. And so what you see here is that in fact it, it's, it's up in the monocyte and those, uh, those FOLER2 macrophages, but not in the other one. So again, uh, if you just use this marker, you will uh, not be able to, uh, to distinguish be between those two populations. Uh, yes, it's a bit complicated, but so also what, what we found, uh, but this is again quite work in progress and you have to, to also keep in mind that uh, we are in the human setting and in the cancer setting, so uh, uh, you have a lot of viability, but what we, we are starting to understand is that in fact this FOLER2 macrophages seems to be already there in non-metastatic lymph node and also in juxta tumor. And uh, it's only when you have metastatic uh, lymph node and primary tumor that you lose a bit these FOLER2 macrophages and that you gain in uh, these other macrophages. So we, we, we have a hypothesis, but it still has to be confirmed, that maybe you have two types of macrophages that infiltrate the tumor and the lymph node. You have um, macrophages that are recruited from uh, blood, that, that are blood monocyte recruited to the tumor site, and that give rise to these APOE CADM1 macrophages. And maybe you have a tissue resident macrophage that is already there in the tissue that also infiltrates the, the tumor microenvironment, but that was already there in the tissue that could be uh, potentially uh, embryonic derived. Um, uh, macrophages and this we have absolutely to, to confirm. Uh, 
I will also finish, in fact, by talking about how we can target those macrophages in tumor. So, uh, so far, you have many clinical trials trying to target macrophages. And so far, there are two uh, sort of two options. One option is to reprogram the function of those stands and to promote their tumoricidal function. And this is um, afforded by um, some by stimulating CD40 or by blocking uh, some uh, some uh, signal that. Uh, blocking in the tumor cells don't eat me signal that will allow macrophage to eat the tumor cells. But you have also uh, another uh, strategy, which is to block uh, the recruitment of monocyte in the tumor and to also, uh, in, uh, also interfere with the survival of those macrophages. But as you now understand, these, those are really strategies that will block both monocytes, all the macrophages all together that, that are not very specific. And so our idea is now with the, our new uh, subset of macrophages to try to uh, find a specific target that will be uh, more, uh, more uh, efficient. Here are the, all the clinical trials and the drug name that are uh, already uh, tested um, uh, in the clinic. And so what we are now focusing in the lab is um, on the trem 2 pathway. So as I was showing you in the single cell, we found, in fact, that these uh, pro-tumoral macrophages express a very specific uh, signature, which involves trem 2 APOE, SPP1, and GPNNB. And this was very immediately quite striking because this is the same signature that is found in Alzheimer's disease, in so, uh, brain um, macrophages when, uh, they are in, uh, when the, the <coughs> Alzheimer's disease progresses. Uh, there is uh, a signaling uh, through TREM2 and APOE that leads to a regulation of uh, a set of marker, and you see here GPNNB and SPP1. And so TREM2, APOE, GPNNB, SPP1 are genes that we specifically find in our, one of those two populations of macrophages. And so we started to uh, dig a little bit uh, in, in these genes, and uh, we uh, focused first on one gene, which, which is GPNNB. It's a, a glycoprotein, because actually there is maybe mostly one lab working on this protein in, the, in Texas. And uh, they claim that this protein is an uh, immunosuppressive gly glycoprotein that uh, inhibits T cell responses and the models of uh, GBHD. But it also has uh, other innate function of uh, cytokine regulation. And, and, uh, but the, the role of this protein is not very clear. And so, uh, so here again, th these are the, my we call them TAM1, the one that are CADM1. So you see that they, are, they have a bad prognosis. But when you just look at GPNNB, you see as well that it has a, a bad uh, prognosis. And uh, we think that this could be a good uh, uh, target to, to look. So we generated a, a knockout mouse for GPNNB. This is a full knockout. And uh, ah, yeah. so what I wanted to, to, look, to, to tell you also is that when you look at those two TAMs, in fact, it's highly expressed in the TAM1, but we see sometimes some expression in the other TAM. So um, uh, this also raised some questions I will try to answer. And we also look in, um, in by, flow, by uh, histology and we see uh, also GPNNB really near the, the tumor border. And so we generated those mice, we bought those mice, in fact, and uh, we just last week did an experiment with B16, so melanoma a tumor cell line, which is, has nothing to do with breast. But uh, we know this cell line is very, uh, uh, does not give rise to immune responses, is very immunosuppressed uh, tumor model. And what you see is when you implant this B16 in 
uh, GPN and the knockout mass, the tumor do not grow. I wanted to show you that because I'm very happy about this result. <laughs> And, uh, and, and this is very preliminary data. So we looked at the, the immune infiltrate of those tumors and we see that they have much more uh, immune cells, uh, in particular T cells are, uh, are, are more present in the, in the tumors from GPN deficient mice. So um, our idea uh, so far uh, is that uh, you have those two macrophages that may come from different sources, although we do not exclude that monocyte, this has been reported in, in other models, monocyte could give rise to two types of macrophages uh, inside the tumor because also what, what is important to understand is the tumor itself is very heterogeneous tissue and you, you have some part of the tumor that is more hypoxic <coughs> or other part of the tumor that has more vessels. So you could imagine a monocyte arriving in the tumor microenvironment and having uh, to deal with different signals and differentiating in different types of macrophages. So this could be uh, one way. The other way could be that it comes from two different uh, sources of uh, macrophages, a monocyte derived macrophages and uh, um, a tissue resident macrophages. And I put here GPNLD in the middle because so far I don't know yet, and we are, we are trying to, to do more precise experiments, whether this, the upregulation of GPNLD is on both macrophages due to the tumor microenvironment that will impact those two macrophages separately, or if it's really a more the the attribute of one of the two macrophages. But what we think is that GPNNB is really highly uh, enriched in macrophages uh, from the tumor, and we do not find GPNNB expression in uh, non-metastatic lymph node or uh, blood, of course, or just a tumor. So this would be really a, a target uh, specific for tumor-associated macrophages. And so I will finish. Um, by thanking uh, all the people involved in the, the work. Uh, Rodrigo is the postdoc in charge of this project, Johan, a, st a bioinformatics student, uh, and another PhD student that is helping with the mouse experiment, and uh, a big uh, team effort because, of course, initially the cohort of patients that we got was analyzed by, uh, by many different uh, people in the lab and the collaborator. Thank you.